Well, I think starting is easy. What's hard is when you hit the plateau. Mm. When you hit that first plateau, I'm not getting better. Mm. But where the mistake that we all make is that we actually are getting better. Everything exciting about life is on the other side of that decision. Right. It's simple. Do you want to change or not? It only takes one decision. One decision today. And then you make the decision again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. In today's world, most people live a life just because they have to and not the life they want to. That's the topic of discussion on today's episode of Seekers Mind Talks with Brian Andreco. Brian is a life coach and author and the host of the Just Getting Started podcast in which he has interviewed over 450 amazing individuals. This includes CEOs, authors, writers, thinkers, artists, anything that you can think of. In today's episode, we dive deep into the idea of getting out of that survival mode in life and start doing things that you really want to do for yourself and walking your own path. We also look upon the hurdles that a person face when they start walking their own path and much more interesting information of self-discovery. Just watch today's episode as usual. I'm your host, Raj, and you are watching Seekers Mind Talks, the science and spiritual podcast. So, Brian, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, man, for people to just get to know yourself a little bit better. Yeah, Raj, I mean, I can, it depends the rabbit hole I want to go down here. Um, I, I think, you know, what's interesting is I've been trying to figure out a lot of things for a lot of years of like, who is Brian and, you know, th this whole journey I've been on. And what I've realized over the last few years with the help of my mentor, Rich, is kind of define myself as one word, as a navigator, you mm -hmm. know, to help navigate people to just get started, to kind of look at their own path in life and say, am I doing it the way I really want to be doing it? You know, and kind of look more inward. And I call it my compass. Like, how do you find your compass? Because I think we all have like an inward compass, something inside us that we know we want, but it's, are we being true to it or not? So that's kind of about me is like being a navigator. Everything stems from that. The way I help people, the way I, you know, kind of show up in the world is really being curious and figuring out, is this the way I want to live going forward? having that kind of inner discussion and then moving in a direction that's best served for me and, and the people close to me. So mm -hmm. that's in a nutshell. Again, I go to a lot of different areas, but that's kind of how I think about it as we're, as we're chatting here in yeah. late 2024. What, what got me magnetized to you is exactly what you just defined uh, is because I am around my 30s now, mm -hmm. uh, going to my 30s, I should say. And we all hit that period where gosh, what I've been doing with my life, uh, is this what I really want to do? And a lot, many people, I think, shy off from that idea and it's fear that gets us holding back. And what makes you different is you, you, you put up the courage to walk your own path. And when you look back now, I can certainly say that you're really happy with what you did. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the story of how you made that difference, at least mentally? You know, it, it really started, so I'm 41 for context, so just a, but it really started back, I think, when I was in my late 20s. And there wasn't a, an exact moment of like, oh, this happened and all of a sudden it changed. It was a series, I mean, dozens upon dozens, and we can, you know, get into some of those if you want. But I, at the, at the crux of it, I just had this idea in my head that I'm just supposed to kind of go through life and not bang into any walls, not let, you know, not branch out maybe and just be, you know, like don't mess up everything. It's kind of that whole Steve Jobs quote. If you're, if you've ever seen that video of like, yeah, don't bang into too many walls, you know, just kind of have a safe life. That's really what my life was. And what I started to realize was like, I wanted to be more than that. So there was this inner battle between, you know, we'll call it the old Brian and this new Brian that want to emerge of like, I want to do a lot of other things. And it's not this whole grandiose, like I want to change the world or whatever. Certainly I want to make a different impact, but I was getting very complacent of where I was and I was really stuck 
in this career that I didn't know if I really wanted to be in. And the people that I were around, I liked some of them, but others were really almost sucking the life out of things. Because what I started to realize was like, I was a people pleaser for most mm -hmm. of my life. And I was also a middle child, which made me be needy and need attention. So imagine those two together. You have someone that's really needy, that needs attention, that feels like you know the attention's been underserved for his life, and he's a people uh, pleaser. Well, I attracted a lot of people that loved attention, that lo because I wanted to give them attention, and they were willing to give me some. But what I realized was actually it was the other way around. Was I was giving them attention because they really seeked that attention, they were driving for it. But I also like being a people pleaser, so that kind of pleased me almost as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a weird dynamic but i hung around with the wrong people is in simple terms and when i started to find a better core group and trust me i had really good friends i'm not saying i didn't have friends but just other you know acquaintances like people i would get involved with and stuff wasn't the best fit and when i started to seek out new people it's amazing how that changed the course of my life and and i kind of see that especially over the last five or six years has been amazing but um yeah, I mean, I could take it a lot of ways, but that's really, it, it was really this struggle of like, do I want to be where I'm at or do mm -hmm. I want to change and go forward? I will tell you one thing that I knew back then that I was willing to do. Um, I didn't know how committed I would be, but I knew I wanted to delay gratification. And what I mean by that is I knew that in order to get to a new spot, it was not going to happen overnight. I don't know why I knew that or why, how I figured that out. I can't recall at this time, but all I knew is this is, to give you an idea, this is like back 2008, 2009, 2010, when like it really started to kind of fester in my mind. I just knew that it wasn't going to take a couple months or a year. Like I needed to give myself a long runway, but I was willing to put in the work and try to change. Was it perfect? Was it always on point? Absolutely not. But I at least had that direction in my head that I knew this was going to be a long journey, but I was willing to take it because I did not like where I was at the time. Hmm. Have you heard about this idea of the marshmallow test? It's, uh, it's, it's sort of what you just explained right now. So they did a study on children uh, when they were like three or four or whatever. I don't exactly remember. So they were given two cho choices. They could have either one mar marshmallow now or they could wait for some time and then get two marshmallows later on. And years pass, they look at where the children are right now. And when they look back, the person or the child who was able to delay his gratification for getting something more had apparently reached at better standards in life, which is exactly what you defined right now. Yeah, that's and what happened, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and you said that uh, there was a major difference when you actually changed your group. So, what was the qualities that got changed that when you made that switch? Well, I think I was trying to seek people that were more forward thinking, mm -hmm. people that were I, you could use the word ambitious, like people that weren't settled with where they were. They were always seeking to learn. They all, mm -hmm. like I'll give you an example. I got, and this is a lucky. Uh, thing that happened because I think luck plays a ton of role in our life. Now, you can always argue that, well, if you're doing things, you're creating opportunities for that luck to come up, right? Uh, but my mentor, Rob, who's still a, a great mentor to this day, I got hired at the company. I was employed 24, very small startup. This is 10 years ago now. But Rob was the the founder with his wife. Rob and Mary Beth founded the company and, and he was still like chief product officer hmm. there. Um, and what, every time I spent like minutes or hours with Rob, it was just this rush of like, what I, I felt like I could just grab the world, you know, by the, by the horns and just whatever the bull, the bull by the horns and just take over the world because he had this enthusiasm with everything he did, whether it was the product we were trying to sell or the industry we were in, or just in general, like philosophical on life. So like those were the type of people I tried to associate with more. I wanted to be in those type of rooms where I'm not saying, again, a lot of the friends that I had back in the day that are still friends today, I'm not saying it's a bad thing of like, 
we'd sit and watch football for 10 hours and never talk about anything more than surface level life. That's okay. That's, I think that's good for time to time, but I was seeking more than that. So mm. I had to find people that were actually like Rob that were willing to be curious and willing to question themselves. See, that was a big thing with me when I was younger, like kind of you talk about these two Brian's, the younger Brian always thought he knew it all. And he was scared to kind of poke and prod and be wrong about something. Even though I didn't know it all at, at any stretch of the imagination, I had this facade, this ego, like, oh no, I know it all. I think that was to protect me from getting hurt. I think there's a, there's a part of that as I look back. And when I really opened up to like, what don't I know? This adage of like, the more I learn, the less I know. It was just a whirlwind of uh, information that was able to come in of like, okay, but where can I improve now? Oh, this area? Do I like what I'm doing there? Okay, can I question it? Okay, no. And I'll keep moving around. And all of a sudden, over years and years and years, you start building up this kind of like this new fortress of this human being that never existed, all because I was just willing to question myself. Hmm. Have you heard of the quote? I think there was, there's this quote. Uh, it's like, uh, most people, most people die at the age of 25, but aren't buried until 60. I don't remember the yeah, philosopher who that, said yeah. that. No. Uh, but I think what he means is by that one term that you defined, the enthusiasm in life and uh, getting that novel experience. And um, one, one idea that actually uh, circulates around this, uh, this decade is the idea of the NPCs. You might have heard of it. Yeah, yeah NPCs, uh, I think it's kind of similar to this one in which it's basically like systems, they take over us to the point that we lose that ability of being human to bring out and create new stuff. I wanted to touch base, how do you think about this NPC meme culture? In relation to just making decisions or like a, in terms of our human life? Yeah, because it, it relates to the quote I just said to you. And um, you see that after an age, people don't want to bang the walls. It's But that kind of makes society sad in some sense. Yeah, I don't know if I'm wrong here. Well, I think you're, I mean, I think there's two, the, the, and you can make it binary in a variety of different ways, but I think there's a... a group of people, whatever percentage that is, that they get to whatever age. I mean, I think you can look this up. I'm sure there's, I know there's research around this late twenties, early thirties males that, you know, they, they want to find meaning and purpose or whatever, right? There's a handful of them, whatever that percentage is that says, I'm just tired of what I've been doing and I'm going to change in whatever direction. And then I think there's an amount of people that just for whatever reason, their upbringing, the group they're around, et cetera, et cetera, they just are unwilling to commit to a change. And they just are like, I'm, I'm good as is. And we see this a lot. I mean, you know, you could see this with the health crisis we have in the, I mean, this is around the world, but definitely in the U S with obesity, where it's at, you know, you could see this with, again, where we're at like the highest depression rates that we've had in years. Um, you know, why is that? Well, you can blame social media. You can blame a lot of different stuff, but it's like, we haven't made a decision to go in another direction. We're kind of just settled, but there's also, as you know, you and me and others, right? We've made this decision of like, I could do better. I could be better. I could bring more to the world, right? Well then let me do that. So how can I go down that direction? I, I, it's so, I always bring it back to simple. Like we overcomplicate the shit out of things. It's simple. Do you want to change or not? Yes, I want to change. Okay, now let's build the systems and make the commitment to change. Okay, I'm committing to change. All right, now I have to fix. This is my whole compass framework, right? It's like, now I have to have an objective. You know, I have to change my mindset. Like, it's it's pretty simple if we want to get better. I think the challenge goes back to what we started the conversation with. Most people, and I put myself in that position a while ago, we're unwilling to question ourselves and say, what do I want? What do I truly want? Take out everyone else out of the equation. Let me sit in silence and think what comes up in my head that I want. And if we can sit in that thought and come up with that, we have to make the decision. Do we move in that direction or not? It's that simple. 
again, it's, it, it's hard to implement, right? After yeah, decision. It, it also arrives at a certain degree of self awareness as well, right? Because sure. I think, as you as you said, like a lot of people slide through it with, without even questioning your self at some point. Sorry, absolutely. I, I mean, that's yeah. where that's where I got at this point was like I questioned myself. It was just, do I like where I'm at? No. Okay. I'm going to be better. Well, how am I going to be better? Well, I just question it. Well, what, what am I doing today that I don't like as well? Okay. Well, let's, okay. Well, can I do better in that? Yes. Okay. Well, how do I do better? Oh, you know, and then you just question and you go on this path, right? Mm. We could relate it with a, I mean, I, I look at my life and I can't speak on anyone else. These are just my personal experiences. Like whether it's been the relationship with my son, whether it's been, uh, fitness with CrossFit or different events, whether it's been the podcast or publishing books, like there's so, whether it's been financial, there's been so many areas that I look back 10 years ago and I'm like, I may, what you would consider 180 degrees, whatever that phrasing is, different human being than I was 10 years ago in all of those different disciplines. Well, how is that possible? Well, I made a conscious decision to change. I knew it wasn't going to happen overnight. So I was willing to delay the gratification and I made small incremental advancements in all of those areas. And here we pop out, let's say, you know, again, using 10 years later and all of a sudden I'm a different human being. So what do we learn from that? Well, we learned that it doesn't happen overnight. You have to make decisive decisions. If that decisive decisions, can I, is that a, is that a phrasing? You have, you can't just be like him and Han, like, cause I think indecision, I don't know if you see this, like, I think indecision plagues a lot of individuals. They have too many options and they don't even know where to choose. Hmm. Right. And that's, that's maybe the starting point going back to what we said earlier. What do you really want? Well, I want to do X. Okay. Now, am I willing to commit to it? That is literally the first step you're make, you're making, going back to mindset, you're making that in your mind before you take any physical action, you mentally have to make that commitment that you're willing to put in the work. Mm. But if you don't make that in your mind, if you don't make that commitment to yourself, I, I, I think it's hard to move down that path because once you hit a barrier, you'll walk away and quit. Is it fear that blocks the people or is it that thinking that, I have to do all this extra work. Well, what do you think? I mean, I guess it depends on what we talk about. Fear, you know, what what do we think of as fear, right? Um, if we say like I'm fearful to put myself out in the world, right? That was one of my things. Mm -hmm. Well, once I can get around the fact that I don't care what, and and by the way, it's not like I don't care. I I still care to this day, like what certain people think. I don't care what all of them think. I used to care what everyone thought. But once you're able to overcome that or get around that or suppress it, at least for a time being, okay, well then can I get past that? I think fear is just one piece of it though. I think there's more things than fear. Um, like I said, we go back to this whole thing of like, where's my life right now? Who are the people I'm around? What information am I consuming? Because that's a lot of it too. Mm. Right. I might not be scared of something, but it might be I'm I'm unknown. It's it's unknown to me. Now you can argue that, okay, Brian, maybe that's fear. I don't know. Right. We can argue the semantics of that. But it could just be like, I've never done this before. I don't know how to do it. Um you know. So uh, I'll cut you in between. Uh, so if I'm starting this uh, podcast, for example, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. And certainly that got me in a position of fear at some point. And um, that actually, I think, extrapolates to anything that you do that is new to you. And when you started your journey, and um, you probably have that now itself, uh, does that affect you? The fear? Yes, the unpredictable nature of doing new things. Oh, sure. Uh, absolutely. Well, and that's why I don't know if it's fully fear. I think fear is part of it. For me, it was also a confidence thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I was good enough, right? It's why I wrote my first children's book, Luke's first, Luke's first round of golf, uh, in 2012 when my son was born. And I, you know, I had a good percentage of it written, the rough copy. I didn't publish it until 2021, May 2021, it published because I wasn't a children's book author in my head. 
there wasn't, I mean, you could call it fear, but it was, I wasn't confident, you know? So I think, yeah, absolutely. There's all these things that we go through of like, I'm not good enough. What are people going to think? Am I going to be able to do it? I don't know how to, I don't know how to publish a book, you know, like all of these things come into play. Um, and there it's, at the end of the day, it all comes back to their excuses. Their excuses for not doing something. That's it. Because I've made every single one of them, right? What's your whole idea about uh, passion? Do passion exist? Do you stumble upon it? How do you find your passion? Does, does passion exist? Absolutely. Do you find your passion? Um, I, I like how... Here's the always the question, right? Is should I do what I'm passionate about? Mm -hmm. Right? Do you get do you, does this come up in conversations with your end? Like, I want to I want to do what I'm passionate about, right? This actually that point you made stumps to something deeper because our society is all in all built around safety, mm -hmm. and even even your dad tells this, even your parents tell this, your friends tell this when you are. When you want to go down a quote unquote different route to just get started, all these opinions come in and they just want to be you to be safe. They don't want you to exactly as we began, as Steve Jobs said, they don't want you banging the walls. But everything exciting about life is on the other side of that decision. Right. Because we don't know if it, by the way, if we never get to that side, we don't know if it's exciting or not, right? <laughs> You're right. I mean, you have to, so going back to passion, like I think we all have passions. Right? I have passion about a lot of things. I need, I, I so I, let's take it in two ways. Tell me if I'm answering this as you'd like. I can do the passion of like, do I, do I want to do podcasting? Do I want to write books? Do I want to go CrossFit? Do I want to, you know, whatever you know, play certain activities. All right. That's a passion. And I should do more of those. Like that's one of the things I've really tried to do, especially even this last year is, you know, I've been following a lot of Jesse Itzler stuff the last several years. I don't know if you know Jesse, um, but he has his like big ass calendar. I don't know if you've ever seen this thing. It's like this, I, I have the, the new one in the closet, but it's like this massive calendar you put on the wall. And I had it for 2024. And it was one of the first times I really looked at a full year out on paper, saw everything and started to map out my year, you know, the, the month or so prior to that year starting. I'd never really done that before. I had ideas and goals, but I never actually put it on paper and mapped it out. And what it really taught me was like, why don't I put everything I want to do so the races I want to, you know, be involved in the, the trips I want to take with my son, the, you know, all this stuff, let's put that on the calendar first and then fill in every other thing around there. And mm -hmm. I think where a lot of us make mistakes is we put all this, you know, we, we do it day to day, week to week, month to month. And we fill all the like, oh, I got this meeting with this client or my boss wants me to do this or, you know, whatever. And you let everyone else fill up the calendar. And then you're like, oh, let me get to that. Let me get to the gym. Well, I haven't got to the gym in three weeks. I've been busy. No, you haven't prioritized the gym. Like I would argue it's you haven't prioritized the gym, right? So that's one piece of passion. The mm -hmm. other side of passion is, should you do that as a career, right? Because this is the, the, the chicken or the egg, the argument that everyone gets in. Do I, do I start with my passion? Do I start with whatever? I would argue that passion comes over time. If you're, by the way, you might be extremely lucky. You know, you might love playing basketball and you're good enough to play professionally. And you do that because you love it and you're passionate about it. And you're actually extremely talented. There is a rare breed of individuals that kind of cross sect at the beginning to those. What most people I would venture to guess is in two camps. They're extremely passionate about something. And they go hard into it and they figure out a way to make that a career somehow, some way. And then there's folks that have a skill, but they may or may not be passionate about. They have a skill and because they make that successful, let's say with a business they start, now that actually becomes a passion, right? 
And that's, I had, when Seth Godin was on my podcast, it's one of the most profound things. I remember when he said this was like, you become passionate with what you're successful with. If you ask anyone, almost anyone, I won't say everyone, we won't put in that bucket, but almost everyone that's successful, they're passionate about what they're doing because they became successful, right? Whether they're making money or making a difference or whatever, they're successful. Well, of course, they're going to be passionate about that thing. Rarely do you see like business owners. Now, again, there's probably some that hate what they're doing, but they still do it because they're making some money. But a lot, if you would talk with them, they'd be like, oh, I love what I'm doing. Well, why? Oh, because it's successful. So the passion can come from doing something and making it a success. You may not start off that way. So that mm-hmm. actually changed my thinking a lot because I was the other way. Four or five years ago, I was like, no, go toward your passion and you got to do what you're passionate about. And then I was like, actually, I do think this is a little opposite. I think you you start with your skill, the thing that you can give to the world that you're great at. And that could work into turning into a full passion if you want to go that route. Anyways, that's, do, do you agree with that? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah. So when you go like that, uh, do you think that uh, a passionate life will always end up in a sort of entrepreneurship if it has to be sustainable? No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think there's plenty of people that could work a job and enjoy that job and they want to go, you know, five o'clock, I'm out. And they want to go play pickleball or do their garden or do whatever. I absolutely think that's relevant for a lot of people. Hmm. Probably the majority of people. Because I, starting a business is very difficult. Sustaining a business is very difficult. I'm still in the throes of very early on. I, you know, knows about sustaining a business, right? You talk to someone that's been doing it for 20 years, like, okay, how'd you sustain and build, right? There's a lot of those. And certainly big corporations got started by one or two or a handful of people, right? So they all started from somewhere small, most likely. I think the majority of people are going to not be the number one, not want to run a business. They want to work for someone else, which is fine. They can be passionate about that. Just like when I told you with Rob, when I went there and started with that company, I was extremely passionate. I loved going in there and working with them. I love what we were doing. We were making a difference, I thought. And I was very passionate about it. But I was an employee. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. So I think it just depends. What I would argue is, are people spending, the going back to what I mentioned with the calendar, are people spending enough time on the things they're passionate about? Or are they too enthralled in work? Meaning they have a job they don't really like, but they're spending, you know, it's seven o'clock at night. And instead of reading to their, you know, daughter, When she goes to bed, they're on a work meeting that they hate. That's the big issue I think we have in our world today. Too many folks aren't able to leave like they could 30 years ago. They leave the office at five and they don't talk to anyone until 9 a.m. the next morning, right? That doesn't happen so much nowadays. And and still, when you ask people, like, if you really, really love your job and if you sit with them for a moment, take that moment, you can see that a lot majority of people, they actually hate it at some point. Mm -hmm. It's only a very small proportion that actually really love their job, but they don't want to get started. Yeah, and again, for listen, I haven't pinpointed it yet. I'm still on that journey of figuring out why. Like, if you're stuck, if you're lost, if you're uncertain about where you want to go, why would you just keep going doing that? And, and be in like this depressive state. I haven't figured it out yet why some people change and some haven't. But I just think at, at, at some point there's a rock bottom hmm. and we all hit it. But we all have these pivotal moments in life and they come and go, right? Right. You have, I had a you know, pivotal moment. I had my son. I have a pivotal moment where I've got laid off. I've had pivotal moments where I got divorced. I've had pivotal moments where I started the podcast. Let's say, you know, like all these pivotal moments in life it's how do we react to them? You know, and this goes back to, again, we keep kind of threading the, 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 or weaving together the conversation because I think it's relevant. It goes back to simplicity, right? It's like, if you delay gratification, at least my belief, you give yourself a longer runway for decision-making. Mm-hmm. So for instance, how about that person that hates that job? They might not be able to leave the job because they have a 
car payment, they have a mortgage payment, they have all these other things they have to do. But if they were thinking about it differently, said, okay, I want to leave this job and do something else, or I want to quit it to start a business, like whatever. Okay. What do I have to do? Well, you know what? I have to chunk away a certain amount of money. So I have that freedom to do that. Or maybe I need to, you know, chunk away some money or pay down the debt so I can move to another area, like whatever. It could be a variety of things. Fine. It always seems like it comes back a lot to money. Like I'm at this job because I need to make money. Okay. Well, could you leave the job and go somewhere else or take a six month hiatus and just you're burnt out and just like, I need a break. A lot of people can't do that. They're living paycheck to paycheck because yeah. they haven't made the choice to delay the gratification. And I think that's a huge piece for a lot of people. When you start talking about happiness and living a passionate, fulfilled life, it's making better decisions today really for the tomorrow you. Yeah. I had this world famous athlete, Nick Butter, on my show. He was the first person to run a marathon in every country in the world. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, and I sort of had a similar conversation with him. And he was saying that uh, a lot of people would not go to their job if the money was not offered to them. And that's actually a good marker that you're not doing the thing that you really want to do with your life. Yeah. Because if you, if you are, if you are pointing your life in the direction you really want, money would not be a factor. You'll be so committed to it that you will bring out something to the world. Well, I think it's important. I mean, money at the, at, in this day and age, now it may not have been three or 400 years ago, you know, maybe you just, you had your little farm and you cap up the farm and the animals and maybe you did a community, you know, sharing with your neighbors, but that was pretty much your life. Most, most people I would assume. Well, nowadays you kind of have to make money. I mm. have a mortgage. Maybe I, maybe people have car payments. Maybe people have all, you know, they have certain things they want to travel. They want, so it's, it's hard to say like, oh, I can't just not work. Most people don't have that luxury. But if you're going to work to your point, it's like, okay, but do you like what you're doing or not? Cause that's the, I think that's the first question, right? Do I like what I'm doing? Yes or no. Again, it's simple. Yes. I like what I'm doing. Cool. Let's keep doing it. Maybe I want to make more money. I want to get promoted. I want different responsibilities. You know, you can, I want to do different projects, right? Maybe I don't like this. I like what I'm doing, but I don't like doing it at this company because things have changed. So I want to look for another avenue. Cool. Like whatever that is. But at some point, like you have to make that decision of like, do I like this or not? And then again, do you make the conscious thought to change or, or not? I don't know why I do like, I've talked with a lot of people over the years that they'll be like, you know, let's say uh, we'll just use a hypothetical, but like, you know, they're in engineering and they're like, you know, I really want to do marketing. Okay. Are you willing to take a step back? You know, you're making X amount in jail. Are you willing to take a step back and go into a marketing role where you might have to go more entry level? Now your salary might decrease by 30% for the next year or two, but you will make that back up eventually. And guess what? You're going to be a lot happier, less stress, less anxious, et cetera, et cetera, by taking that marketing job. Are you willing to do that? I would ration the guess almost everyone would not. Only a small percentage of people be willing to take a step back to do actually what they want. How, how much does ego get in the way when you are walking your own path as you did? Because this is ultimately comes to a decision of whether you want to face your own ego or not, right? Yeah. <laughs> ego gets in the way every day. I get ego at the CrossFit gym, you know? I mean, you, you're you're trying to lift heavy weights. And that like, for me, as an example, like I'm trying to, even though I don't like running, I've been pushing myself to run more, like to do more half marathons and eventually a marathon and stuff. And so for that, I still have to lift weights, but I don't have to lift heavy weights. I have to get out and do more cardio, right? I got to do more flexibility, mobility. So when I'm at the CrossFit gym, I'm not lifting nearly as much weight as I could before. It's not that I can't lift the weight, it's I'm not doing that because I know I can get injured or, or maybe, you know, whatever, too, um, too sore for the next day or whatever. So ego comes into play every day just on even stuff like that. And that's where, yeah, I think I like where you're going with this is like, we have to be willing to be open to change, to say, 
I don't know it all, or maybe I'm willing to sacrifice something today, going back to like for a better tomorrow. But if we don't think we can change, if we don't think we're you're like, oh, I got, I got the answers. Or again, how, what mostly happens, because Brian, the younger Brian, used to do this a ton, is I point fingers. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's Raj's fault. That's why, that's why I didn't get that promotion. Or so and so, you know, that's the reason. And it's just this constant outward pointing instead of looking inward. Which wanted to point me to the direction of responsibility. Do you think that freedom and responsibility are inherently tied together? Freedom and responsibility tied together. Mm. Let me think about that for a minute. I mean, are you saying it in the sense of, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you for a clarification because I want to make sure we go on the right path, but like response, I mean, I can have freedom or hopefully I'd have freedom depending on the country you live, right? Freedom to make choices, to do what I want, kind of free will. There's certain rules and regulations I have to follow though. Right? Because. The reason why I ask that is because it's ultimately freedom that we are all craving for, the freedom to do the thing that we really want to make us happy. It's all a run for happiness. It's it's rooted to your beliefs, uh, but the freedom to do the thing that you want actually requires some responsible actions from your side and that requires hard work in some level. That's why I want yeah. us to... Yeah, if you're going that direction, yes, I I agree. Because I would argue there's a lot of people that don't want freedom or don't care about it. They like the bubble they put themselves in. They like the shell that they have. They don't want to break out and meet new people or try new things or whatever. Again, we can argue why they don't want to do that. I don't know. But yeah, if you want to be free, quote unquote, and think differently and try new things, yes, you have to take responsibility. Because, and, and and this goes back to another word, um, is accountability. You have to be accountable. And maybe you want to have, maybe you, you have accountability partners as well, but you have to be accountable. Well, how does that look? Well, a lot of times that's saying, I'm going to do this and then actually coming through and doing it. Because we're all at fault for this. We say we're going to do something and then we don't follow through for whatever reason. It could be something very small or it could be something very big. So I think if we want to live that, that life of like, when I think of freedom, it's really that I'm not stressed out. Like I'm living Mm -hmm. fully how I want. And it may not be how other people that other people agree with. And that's okay. As long as I can get up every morning and say, you know what, based on the information I have, and where I want to go in life, I'm making decisions to lead down that path. Mm. That is freedom to me. Like mm. I'm, I'm having that. It's when I have to put myself in a position, like we were talking about earlier, maybe if you're in a poor financial position because you haven't made good decisions in the past, well, you're not free because you have to, you know, you have to show up at that job. You have to do certain things because of poor decisions you made, but it only takes one decision. One decision today, and then you make the decision again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. Like it's not that you have to make a thousand decisions; it's one decision. You just have to do it over a period of time. Which which circles to another word I wanted to play around with of the idea of procrastination. I'm sure you feel that even now, and it's a lifelong journey to t- tackle with that. It's inherent in humans, but. Yet, if you are to do something, you have to deal with it. How, how do you deal with your procra- uh, procrastinative thoughts? <laughs> oh, man. If you could read my mind on... I, what I, so here's the thing. I procrastinate all, all the time. Mm. However, what I'm better at today than I was years ago is this idea of, you know, I I love Kobe Bryant was always um, my favorite basketball player growing up. And I love the the thought that he has about you don't, I don't negotiate with myself. Like I put something in place and I'm going to get it done. And I used to be the, oh yeah, I'm going to do this or okay, I want to, I want to do this. And then I wouldn't do it and I'd make an excuse for why. 
Now I'm at the, okay, if it's important, remember, I, I may procrastinate stuff, but it's the reality is it's maybe an item that doesn't need to be on the to-do list or I can get to it later. But the stuff that's like non-negotiable, I'm going to get done because I'm not negotiating. I already made the commitment, right? I'll give you an example. As we're talking real time here, we're in you know September. At the beginning of the year, or, or at the end of at the end of last year, remember I was talking about like Jesse Itzler's calendar and these things I wanted to do and these new habits I wanted to form. I said to myself, "Well, there's two things. I'll, I'll actually there's two things. The first one is I said to myself, I want to do something every single day next year. In my life, I've never done like besides brush my teeth and make my bed or something. I've never done something every single day for the." So I said, okay, what could I do? And this is, a, I'm a big believer with anyone trying to get started is how do, what, what's a simple thing I can do every day, but that's going to actually propel me forward in some of my goals. Well, fitness is a big thing for me. Health and wellness is absolutely important. To me. And I'm a tall, thin guy. You know, I have some muscle now since I've been doing with CrossFit for six years, but I'm still tall and thin. So I said, well, my chest is like, a, is not as strong as I think other parts of my body. So I said, okay. I'm going to do 50 push-ups and 50 squats every single day for 2024, right? I didn't say I'm going to do 500 or 5,000 every day because that would be, I might be able to get a couple days in. It's going to be impossible almost to do that for a year. But what's an easy chunk? Well, 50 seems fairly reasonable, right? It takes me a couple minutes most days. So I've done it. Now we're... Midway through September, I have not missed a day. Wow! You know, but now you add up, you add that up, do the math on that. It's it's over like fifteen thousand. I've already done, right? Mm. Minimum, right? Because I do it every day. I still work out and do other stuff. But that was one of the commitments I made at the beginning of the year. Another one is I'm writing my first full length, you know, um, self development book or personal development book or whatever you want to call it, and similar to thing. I said, I can't, I'm not a full-time writer. I'm not going to, I don't think, I'm, I'm not going to say I can't do it. I don't believe that I could keep up write, writing thousands of words per day or even thousands a week. So I said, what's a good chunk that I could do? Well, I could do 500, seem like a reasonable amount. I write this blog that comes out three times a week. Typically those are anywhere from like 200 to a thousand you know, words. So I kind of know like 500 words is not a ton, but it's enough to give me, like, I have to sit down and do it. So I said, okay, I'm going to write 500 words every week for the entire year. If I do just 500 words every day, do the math, 52 weeks, I'm going to have 25,000 words, which is a pretty good sized book. Well, I'm already, we're nine months in, I'm at week 35 and I'm at like 26,000 words because I've written more than 500 some weeks, right? So by the end of the year, I'm guessing I'll be in the 30,000 range or low 30,000. That's a pretty good book. Now I have to edit it and, and do all that. That's just the first rough draft. But what I'm getting at is the procrastination. I still do that on a lot of the little stuff, but I don't negotiate with myself anymore. And it's because I, as I mentioned, I made the commitment. So I can't tell people how to do this. What I will, the, the secret quote unquote that I found is you just build the systems in play to do it. You build the boxes around mm -hmm. and then you just say, I'm not going to get up. Because because the whole thing, I don't know if you, Rod, you deal with this or not. When we have wide open space, that's when we're out of, that's when we're out of control. When there's no constraints. But if we have constraints, like I'm going to publish one podcast interview a week. Okay. That's my constraint. I have to publish one a week. Doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter when I publish it or what I publish. I just have to do one a week. Just the same thing. The 50 push ups. Notice I didn't say I need to do 50 push ups and 50 squats before 7 a.m. I just said I have to do them each day. Like today, I did them before I ate lunch and I did five sets of, or, excuse me, 10 sets of five. Other days, I've done it where I've done like 10 in the morning and then like, 10 like at lunch and then I do a couple here and there and they add up during the day like but I didn't have like wide open space but there's a constraint mm -hmm. so anyways I'll pause there but I think we're always going to procrastinate if we want to 
you can't tell anyone not to. I procrastinate. But I think if we really don't, if we get to that thought of not negotiating with ourselves and putting constraints and then just say, okay, that's the bar. Let's make it a low enough bar where I never miss. That's easy enough. Mm. Yeah. I remember reading somewhere like if you are working a nine to five job, uh, you're actually working for somebody else's dream. And since they put that constraint, you wake your ass up every day, eight o'clock, bang, you are there. Sure. So since that person had that constraint on you, you are willing to do that. So why not do that for yourself, right? Well, it goes back to the delayed gratification, right? Mm. If you want to do something, because by the way, and I, not that I have to say this because it, it, everyone's like this, no one's special. I'm not special, right? You can look and be like, wow, he's had you know, 400 plus podcast episodes. He's publishing his third children's book. We can go down the accolades, quote unquote, I'm trying to be very modest, but like we can go down the accolades of all stuff that I've pumped out over the last, you know, six years, seven years. But the reality is anyone can do that. Hmm. I just made a choice that I wanted to do that and I wanted to stay consistent with it because I knew the delayed gratification. Like I get a chance to talk with you in 2024 and I, whatever I publish now, I think episode 430 uh, launch, but I've, I've really done like 450. Uh, because a, a few of the early ones on the solo episodes, I didn't have numbers on. But let's say I've done mid 400 podcast interviews or episodes. I couldn't say that five years ago or six years ago. I was only at like 100. But I was like, I can't, like, I say this all the time. I can't wait to publish episode 1000. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to get there because I only care about what the next one. I don't care about episode 1000 right now. All I care about is publishing the next one. And that's the mindset I take into it. So if anyone's struggling with like, how do I, how do I do this? There's a lot there. Chunk it out, make it so small you can't miss and just worry about the next action or the next day. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry a year from now, but it, I'll tell you what, if you do it tomorrow and you can keep adding those tomorrows up, you're going to get the 365 days and complete a year or 366, I guess, for 2024 with the leap year, you know? Again, circling, I think it's how much you uh, care for yourself, right? How much you really want to do it. Sure. And uh, yeah, and and you are, a, your idea, your catchphrase, uh, just get started. It's really good. Uh, but I wanted to continue on with that and wanted to ask, um, what are the difficulties that you face after you get started? Certainly, that's just the starting point, but... What do you face after you're start starting a journey? Well, I think starting's easy. I think it's easy to start. I think most people would disagree. Well, they 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 disagree, but I I tell you, anyone that started anything, you know the the the, the first step is easy. Like if I if if you're training for a marathon, you're going to be excited. You hit oh I'm I I just signed up for the marathon. I'm going out for a run, right? I'm excited. The first step is easy. What's hard is when you hit the plateau. Mm. When you hit that first plateau, I'll share this story. I've shared this recently because it, it's a fun story because it's, you know, as a parent, you go through a lot of things with your kids as they, as they grow. But my son started band last year and in sixth grade and he did the trumpet and he was all excited and he got the trumpet. They started doing lessons and he, I mean, I was like, whoa, this is cool. Like he's, you know, he's playing them, you know, he learns how to read music. He's doing all this. He did phenomenal the first several weeks, first month, every day when I'd pick him up from school, I'd be like, Hey, what was the most exciting part of school? Oh, band. I love band. Really? Band was your number one class. Yeah. I love band. I love, you know, whatever. Well, month one finished month one and a half, you get into month two. And I started to notice band wasn't his favorite thing anymore. And as we talked about it more and more, it's because he was frustrated because he hit the plateau. And the plateau, just to kind of share if, if, if anyone's wondering, it's when you hit that first big moment where it's like, I'm not getting better. Mm. But where the mistake that we all make is that we actually are getting better. We just now, our perspective, right? Our perception of how good we are is way up here, right? We used to suck. We used to be at ground zero. 
now we're a little bit better. So we think we're like a pro now. Oh my God, this is easy. I've done it, whatever. But then we get knocked back to earth. And whether we get knocked back to earth in a variety of ways, right? We're playing pickup basketball. We play a better team than we've been playing the last month. You know, like there's a variety of different ways you can do it. So the adversity comes when you hit that first plateau. And the big thing is when you start is knowing that plateau is going to come. Mm. Right? We just typically run into it. So for instance, like let, let's talk about podcasting since we're on a podcast, right? I have a lot of folks I've talked with, and you can see there's a lot of three episode, you know, elephant graveyard of podcasts out there that they didn't get past a few episodes. Well, why is that? Well, they got so excited to publish the first couple that they want. They quit after that. They had a few published and then life got in the way. So how do we get over that? Well, this is again, setting up the systems to get us over the hump when we know it's going to get hard, when we know we're going to run into the brick wall. So for instance, what you might do, let's use, we're using podcasting as the example. We can use a variety of others. What I might do is say, all right, I'm going to have five to 10 episodes in the hopper. And again, going back to constraint, I'm going to make sure like, so if it's an interview platform, that's going to be different than if you're not doing interviews, but I'm going to record every Monday, a new episode right? If you're not doing an interview platform, this makes it super easy. If it's an interview, okay, I got to make sure I get the guests and all that stuff. There's a little more prep there, but let's say it's not an interview show. Okay. Every Monday I'm going to record an episode. So now what do you have? Well, I have five to 10 episodes that are already scheduled out. And every Monday I'm recording an episode, rain or shine, doesn't matter. Well, guess what? I'm always going to be five to 10 episodes ahead. And if I go on vacation and I can't do it, okay, maybe there's one here, one there. But for the most part, I'm going to be ahead. But again, what a lot of folks do is they're just living right now. I'm going to do a podcast today. I'm going to launch it tomorrow. And they forget that next week's going to come. So I think there's an opportunity for preparation here, knowing that it's going to get hard at some point and be willing to kind of glide through that. It's going to suck. And, and again, podcast is different than my son playing, you know, trumpet, right? But it's still the same thing. We're hitting a brick wall at some point. We just have to be willing to understand that we're not sucking. We're not getting worse. We just have to glide through this moment where we feel like we're not improving. It's just more incremental until we get to that next step. Yeah, I get that point. I just want to slide in another point with that. There's this whole idea of 10,000 hours to become a pro at anything. And there's also the 80-20 rule, which states that um, 80% of your productivity comes from 20% of what you do. And when you couple these two ideas together, it's like uh, 80% of something you can learn in 20 hours, but to become a pro, you you must put that 9,980 hours after that to become that pro, to hit that mark. And that's a slow journey after that. But that's where the magic lies. Well, it depends. If, and, I, and I think if you go back to uh, the 10,000 hours, Malcolm Gladwell, like I... And again, I could be totally wrong here. So someone, uh, you know, hit me in the comments if I'm off, but I believe I've read some different things that the 10,000 hours is not fully accurate. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of research out there that kind of not debunks it, but like, again, th this is where it could becomes, uh, it could be argumentative of like, when, when's the line of being great, right? Like when would, would like, let's take Tiger Woods. Cause I'm a, I'm a big golfer. I've always been a fan of Tiger. When did Tiger Woods become great? Right. Was it in 1996 when he won his third straight U S amateur title? Was it in 97 when he won the masters, the youngest winner? Was it in 2000 when he won three major? Like when are we determining greatness? Right. And that's the challenge with the 10,000 hours for me. Always it's all arbitrary. Now, I like where you went with the 80-20. There's actually a guy I would recommend folks look as Josh Kaufman. Have you ever heard of Josh? Do you know Josh Kaufman? I uh, actually have not. But he has the he has a great TED Talk, but uh, it's around like 20 hours. And he uses that in his TED Talk where you could be really good at something, really proficient with about 20 hours of work. And that's the scale I like. Because again, I might not, my, my son might not be a, you know, in the New York city, you know, whatever symphony, um, someday, but he wants to be proficient, right? I think there's an opportunity for us is let's get to the level of good first and then figure out, do we want to keep going at what level? I think the challenge with a lot of folks is they don't even get to that 
they're, they're not even willing to put in an hour. Mm. So how are you supposed to be good then? You know, I, I think you have to put the time in and it could be incremental. Maybe it's 15 minutes a day, but you got to put the time and even see where your level of proficiency is before you figure out, am I going to do this? You know, again, I talk about the passion stuff full time or whatever. I just think we got to get to that point. And a lot of folks are just scared to even, you know, do a couple steps and get going. The reality is like, who knows if you're going to be good or not, but I will tell you 100% certainty, you will not be good if you don't start. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to switch gears and uh, slightly take a detour to something else. Uh, you've you've done 400 or 400 plus episodes and I see that you've... Uh, actually spoke with a lot of founders along your journey. Yep. And you, you probably know their experience, their paths, how they walked their path. Did you find any commonalities in their character? There was definitely some threads, um, some we've already talked about today. And it's, and it's the thing, it's not sexy. It's <laughs> simple stuff. Because the reality is like, we all get lucky breaks, right? Some people start when I, and I, when I say start ahead, what I'm meaning is some people start with certain opportunities. They came from a certain area or family, or maybe they have more resources than others, right? So that could potentially help. But I think there's an opportunity for people that are scrappy to, to make things work as well. But the general thread, and again, it's so simple, it's stupid. They've stayed consistent. There's been maybe a partly a stubbornness of like, I'm not you know, I'm not going to let this thing uh, go. Like I'm going to keep working toward it, but it's, it's consistency. It's consistency and being willing to pivot when the time is right. So again, we've talked about a lot of this already, not letting the ego get into play and saying, I know it all. This is the path. We're doing it this way. It's being open to saying, is that the right direction? Should, should we take the company that way? Could I do it better? Am I the right person to run the company, right? I've had several on that have stepped away. They haven't, they're not CEO anymore because they, someone else would be better or what have you, right? They sold the company because they thought someone else could do it better and maybe they were ready to do the next thing. I think, and I think there's a level of, there's no exact right way, right? Everyone's story is so different. So there's not an exact like, oh, do this. If you do step A, B, and C, you get to step D. It's almost impossible to say that, but it goes back to what we've been talking about all along. If I have an idea or I have something, I, and this is by the way, you're a founder or you an author or whatever, I have an idea. It's most likely uncomfortable, meaning no one around me is talking about it. No one believes that I even am like first time authors I've had on same thing as a first time founder. It's the same thing. They're scared to start. No one around them thinks they should do it. You know how many people like. When I said, hey, I'm going to start this podcast, this is back 2017, mind you. Podcasting was a lot different back then. Like I had so many looks like I had like two heads. Like, you're going to do what? You're going to start a podcast? You're going to podcast? Like I had so many people. Now that could have derailed me if it was the brine of a year or two before that. But I had built up a little more confidence and this kind of idea like I'm going to do it no matter what people say because I have to see this through. So I think there's a level of grit there of like, I'm going to do it no matter what. Now, if you look at most businesses, the way they are day one is not how they are year two or year 10. They pivot, they change, they, they evolve over time. And I think being willing to do that is where I, saw, I, I see a lot of common thread. So there's a few different areas we can go down, but yeah, I would say grit, consistency, um, I would say uh, another thing going back to like accountability, like building a really good support network. Mm. The amount of founders that I've had on and whether they talk about in the episode or we talk before or after or another time that have coaches, that use coaches to improve their business, it, you'd be shocked. It's it, it's not 5%, you know, it's, it's 50% or more. You're like a lot of people use coaches because they understand like, it's just like we're talking about like athletes. You think Tiger Woods goes out there himself? No, he has therapists. You know, he has he has uh, sports trainers, right? He has nutritionists. He, you have a whole team that you build around. It's the same way I think the best founders build a team around them and realize I don't know how to do everything. 
So I'm going to bring in the best people to help us. And we're going to do this as a team. So those are some of the things at least that come top of mind. Wonderful. Uh, so I wanted to touch base with one other point as well that you mentioned. Uh, when do you think is, how do you find the right time to pivot when things, when you think things are working, but it actually is not? Well, only, I don't think there's a right time. I don't think, I don't think you, I don't think you know. I think it's a gut thing. It's a feeling. It's a, you know, do I want to go this direction? This goes back to what we're talking about. Like indecision is a decision. Not making a choice is a decision. So wow. I think a lot of times, like the people that, whether it's us or other people that we're surrounded with, I know for me personally, one of the reasons like I'm in the position I am today and I'm not the Brian of 10 or 15 years ago is because I made decisions. I had to pick a path left or right, right? So I had to do that. So I think if you're trying to time it, it's like the stock market, you know, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. You're in the game, you're going through it. So I think the same thing with, you know, like, do you pivot today or do you pivot in, um, you know, three months or six months? I, I kind of a gut feeling. And, and I think, you know, it's kind of like the winner's right history. You ever hear that phrasing? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of people that entrepreneurs, founders made decisions to pivot and it completely crashed their company and you never heard of them. Right. So it doesn't mean that the, the, the people that did it a certain way is the only way to do it. And it doesn't mean if that other person had nine other chances, it would have went a different way. It just happened for whatever reason, didn't work out for them that time. You know, so I, I don't think it's, I think it's no, like I just had, um, I had this guy, David Riggs on the podcast, uh, uh, Numa Media, really cool guy, really interesting. He has like a, a marketing firm. They do web development, SEO, stuff like that. And one of the things he shared in the podcast is that after like a couple of years running a successful business, I can't remember, they're doing a couple million a year, like really, you know, momentum building. He decided to literally switch everything and do just a complete 180 with a business because he saw something different and he knew in his heart, like this is, a, I don't, I don't want to build the business the way it's built today for the next several years. I'd rather where we're, I'd rather not two or three X this and then change. Let's change now. And that was just a gut decision he had to make. And it was tough. You know, he talked about how it was, it was tough to make that decision. Is it the right or wrong decision? I don't know. They seem like they're in a good spot now and that business is going well. Who knows? But he, he only can make the decision with the information he has at that time. You know, it's like any of us. You know? Actually, yeah, yeah. I also did a whole episode with uh, this guy, Gerd Gigerenser. His whole idea is about uh, trusting your gut and why it is far, far more intelligent than your rational self. And as we bring to a close here, uh, I wanted to ask you one last question, like people who are starting their own path or are on their path, what are your top three books that you recommend to read that will change the way you see the world? Man, top three books. Well, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'll give you a host of them because it depends on what you need, right? Are you looking for tactical, are you looking for inspirational? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things. So let me preface by saying I love reading and the Brian of about six years ago would not have said that. Um, I don't know what it was. I, again, I think it was just this whole change that happened. A lot of it came when I got divorced back in 2018. Like I just decided to make a lot of big changes. And one of those was like, I want to learn, as I mentioned earlier, like, what don't I know? Let me learn more. So I've read dozens upon dozens of books. So books I like, I mean, I think the, the no brainers are like Stephen Pressfield, uh, the war of art, war of art. Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal, you know, book just because again, it, it, it what it does is it calls out, it, it makes us accountable because it calls out that resistance, the excuses we make. It's kind of a lot of it's made up in our head. Um, so war of art's big. Um, I like, you know, like Ryan Holiday is one of my favorite writers. Do you know Ryan Holiday? He does like the Daily Stoic and he's written a lot of these books, but like the one book, well, he has really several books, but like The Obstacle is the Way, 
or Ego with the Enemy, I would recommend both of those. Again, those are more in the philosophical sense of really good storytelling in there. But just taking us back to like the simple things, like what's getting in our way? What are the blockades? A lot of those we're putting up ourselves. Um, and that leads me to what I think everyone should do. And this is not just from a business standpoint or getting started. Like this is just for life. Like how do I become a better person in question? Um, one of the books that changed my life in 2019 was called Loving What Is by Byron Katie. Mm. And she has these four questions that you ask yourself. And it's really just putting up like, oh, I think so-and-so is a, you know, whatever, a certain way. Okay. Is that true? Can't, you know, do I know that's true? Like a hundred percent. Like she asked these questions and what you start realizing is no, everything that you think is really internal because like, I'll give you an example. Like if, if there's like, oh, this person's a a hole or whatever, some, some guy like, oh, that person's treating this person, you know, bad. Okay. I may think they are, but there's also people that love them and cherish them and think they're great. So who's right? You know? So it kind of comes back to, oh, it's my perception on them and how I feel is why I'm projecting. And, and it always comes back to us and it makes us do the internal work that, and, and this is really what's helped me kind of build more gratitude in my life. And I've always kind of been an optimist, but really has brought in that of bringing this positivity and optimism. Cause I'm like, listen, life's tough as it is. There's a lot of things that go bad. Why am I focusing on those? control what I can control, right? And then whatever happens, otherwise I can't control if someone cuts me off. I can't control if someone does something bad. Like all I can do is accept it and then move on from there and, and really have a perspective on it. Like if I could control this, I would have done it in a different way, but I can't. So I have to accept it and I have to live my life as it is. So anyways, those are a few books I would recommend. There's probably 10 others after we get off this, I'm going to think about, but, um, those are really happens to every podcaster. Yeah, those are a few to start with, though. Wonderful, wonderful. I think that's a really good place to end our little session. And uh, as we bring to a close, where can people find you with your work if they are to get in touch with you, to interact with you, maybe get into coaching with you, and everything yeah. that comes in between? Thanks, Raj. Yeah. I mean, my website is the central hub. So it's brianondrako.com, B R I A N. O-N-D-R-A-K-O.com, just my full name. Um, and that has everything. Yeah, the coaching, the books, the podcasts, all this stuff. Um, I do write a blog three times a week, so that's something folks want to subscribe to. It's a lot of this whole idea I talk about with Just Get Started, my compass framework, like all these different ways to make you think a little bit differently to help you move that first step or two forward um, to get started and keep going. Um, and then I, I spent a lot of time on LinkedIn recently. I, I'm, I'm on other social platforms, but not as much. But really, LinkedIn's where I've been, you know, posting a lot, commenting, sharing, those type of things. So that's where folks say hello, and I love to connect with new people. So wonderful, Brian. Thank you for bringing your energy to this world. I appreciate it. Thanks, Raj. Well, I hope you guys all enjoyed Brian's views on walking your own path and building life in the way you want if you enjoyed the episode please do check out our other videos on self-discovery deeper inquiries of life and much more as usual i'm your host raj signing off from seekers mind talks the science and spiritual podcast